This is Where We Live. I'm Lucy Nalbethanchel. American women make up 40% of the civilian labor, 47% rather, the civilian labor force. But in 2017, they're still not on equal footing with their male colleagues. Today, what's being done to eliminate disparities like the wage gap and the leadership vacuum? And what? And once women reach the top in the corporate world, do disparities disappear? Not necessarily. Coming up, we'll hear how African-American women are more likely to get passed over for promotion. How do women of color reach leadership positions? And we'll hear about efforts to encourage companies to hire female senior leaders and executives. Now, what's been your experience as a working woman? Are you a manager that's frustrated with a lack of diversity in candidates for leadership roles? Email where we live at WNPR.org. And you can find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. First, not all corporations are settling for the status quo. Connecticut-based United Technologies Corporation has a plan in place to combat these disparities. Joining us in studio now is Beth Amato. She's Executive Vice President and Chief Human Resources Officer at United Technologies Corporation. Beth, welcome to the show. Good morning. Thank you. So you're on a mission by 2030. Tell me what the plan is. Well, thanks for having me today, Lucy. And let me just talk a little bit about what, uh, why I'm here and why I'm excited to share our journey with you. Earlier this year, United Technologies joined Paradigm for Parity. Paradigm for Parity was started by uh, women executives who recognized that there is a gender gap in leadership roles across corporate America, and their mission is to help close that gap. And they are calling upon businesses across the country to join with them on this mission and to commit to having senior leadership roles be filled by women at a, at a gender parity amount, 50%, by the year 2030. And UTC signed up for this willingly, and I'm very proud and excited that we did. Now, was it a board member's influence that got you aboard? Exactly correct. Ellen Coleman is one of our uh, board members. Ellen is the former chair and CEO of DuPont. She's a founding member of Paradigm for Parity. She's very familiar with how we work and some of the initiatives we already had in place. And she thought this would be a great um, added help for us to achieve this goal. And when we looked at what uh, Paradigm for Parity offered, it, it, it's a perfect fit. They give corporations a roadmap of a way to follow, um, steps to follow, that will help achieve this goal. And it's things we were already doing, but it, we're process-oriented. It gave us a little, bit of a, a little bit of a control around it and a way to speak about it more fluidly to our organization and to our leaders. And I wanted to bring up the fact that the, the board member brought this idea to UTC, um, a female board member, yes. because we're going to hear later in the show that uh, there are very few women in board positions, not we're just leading companies, but when you have a, a female board members, they're able to then help companies hire more women in leader positions. They help influence that. Absolutely correct. And we're proud. We have 25% of our board is represented by women. Uh, In addition to Ellen Coleman, we have Diane Bryant from uh, Intel who leads their data group, and we have former governor of New Jersey and the head of the EPA, Christy Todd Whitman. So they they provide big voice, big support, but also great counsel Mm -hmm. to us as we we, um, map out our strategies here. So by uh, 2030, again, you want to have 50% of your leadership roles um, filled by women. You said you're at 27% now? We're actually, well, Part of the roadmap for parity gives us a, a, a way to focus in on measurement. So uh, in advance of coming here today, I checked our recent numbers. And I'm excited to tell you that we're just a couple of uh, tenths of a percentage point away from actually 29% of our executives are women. And that number actually, um, it, it's 290 out of our 1,007. And uh, that number has actually increased by 92 in total since the uh, beginning of 2013, where we are represented, uh, of women's representation was about 18%. So our executive population has remained flat, but we've increased the number of women dramatically. I'm really excited by that. And that kind of process and that kind of uh, momentum tells me this goal is achievable. Mm-hmm. Well, give me an idea when you say executives. What kind of positions are these women uh, filling at UTC? Terrific. So do you to understand UTC a little bit? We are 200,000 plus employees, globally situated, work in 78 countries, and uh, people don't always know us necessarily by UTC or United Technologies, but they certainly know our four main businesses. So right here in Connecticut, we have Pratt & Whitney, I think uh, in East Hartford. Mm -hmm. Our UT Aerospace Systems has a big population up in Windsor Locks. Uh, Otis Elevators is also headquartered here in Farmington. 
and Climate Controls and Security, which everyone used to know here by the carrier brand, is also part of us. So we have four big business units, and we are run by, as I said, a thousand executives. The kinds of roles we have vary from mine, human resources, finance, um, legal, but we also have uh, women leading in engineering, in supply chain, in operations, in environmental health and safety. So it, that's every function is represented, and uh, out of so we we look at those leadership positions as the folks who run our company. And as I said, twenty almost twenty nine percent of that group is women. Now you mentioned Paradigm for Parity is giving you this roadmap. Um, you've been in the corporate world for some time. What are some <laughs> of the challenges that companies face um, where they're not getting uh, these diverse pool of candidates uh, to hire for their boards or to just get more leadership roles as executives? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, what have you seen in your career? Well, thank you. Yes, I've actually been working for United Technologies for thirty two years, and so have had the opportunity to uh, to run re- human resources at several of our business units and now at the headquarters. And I think what we see is, um, you know, we have tremendous work that we can offer people. It's it's exciting. It's game-changing. Our products are, are innovative, and people like to work on that. Plus, there's an opportunity to really stay with one company for your entire career, but work globally. And that's that's very attractive. However, you know, it, that once you get people in door, and we do a great job of recruiting, it's also about retaining people. And that, to me, is really... Um, one of the hardest things to do because there's so many opportunities out there for people. We have to make not just the work exciting, but the culture of the the workplace such that people want to stay and have their entire careers with us. So we've put a big focus now on really addressing the culture aspects of why people stay and how we can help them develop and grow their careers. So why are people leaving? So people, people, it's pretty simple actually. People leave for a variety of reasons. First and foremost, it's their relationship with their supervisor. You know, and do they have good work to work on? Do they have the tools to do the job? Do they see career advancement? Are the policies of the company such that they can, um, you know, balance both work and personal life? So when I look at what UTC has done on this, there are a few things I can share that I think have been helpful for us to retain people. First is we have a tremendous employee scholar program. It is world class. And that helps people gain skills they need, not just for their job, but frankly, we let them study anything. Um, So I could go back and uh, go to school and become a teacher if I wanted to do that, if I could find the time to do that. Um, But we pay for tuition up front, books, and we give people time off to study. So that's really one of our hallmark program. But it's more than that. Um, We recognize that people value uh, time outside of work. And so we've relaunched our uh, flexible work arrangement program to really help people understand um, using technology today, having um, the ability to work remotely when possible, and provide guidance for supervisors to help them work that with with employees. We changed our parental leave policy. It was a little outdated, I have to confess. Um, Now, uh, birth parents uh, can get eight weeks off for the birth of the child, plus an additional four weeks of parental leave, which is offered to every parent across the company. So it's a much more modern, contemporary, and actually um, benchmark kind of program. Um, so it's it's keeping the, the benefits current. It's having a place where people want to come to work and get excited about what they do. Having the ability to grow your career, those are all reasons why people stay, and we're really putting a lot of focus in on that now. This is where we live today. We're looking at uh, the pay gap and gender disparities in the corporate world. Uh, Beth Amato is in studio with us, Executive Vice President and Chief Human Resources Officer at UTC, United Technologies Corporation. Uh, they have a goal to fill half of the corporation's leadership roles with women, uh, half of them by year 2030, and they're already on track, uh, I think, by almost 30 percent, as uh, Beth mentioned. A little ahead of schedule from our <laughs> internal goals, because we do measure everything, yeah. I mean, this all sounds admirable, um, but you also need to have a leader that's willing to do this. And so talk about that, because not all corporations have leaders that are looking to get that kind of, to, to alleviate these disparities. You're absolutely correct. And I, I think where uh, what distinguishes us and what's allowed us to do this it starts at the very top of the organization. My supervisor who, and uh, our chair and CEO, Greg Hayes, is a, a strong proponent for diversity and inclusion in the workplace. And he has really uh, challenged 
the whole organization, not just human resources, which is very important, challenge the whole organization to make sure we're addressing the needs of our employees, getting the best talent that's available out there, and recognizing that the world has changed. So, you know, he is, uh, when as he grew up through United Technologies, he was always a champion for women as well. He was the, the first uh, the chair of the Women's Finance Council, so he was the champion for that when he led the finance organization. And uh, he's just been, you know, a, you know a, a steadfast in his commitment in this regard, which clearly having uh, worked for other supervisors in the past, it makes my job so much easier. And I would say it's not just him. The four business unit presidents, as well as the leadership team that supports Greg uh, and me, are all on board with this. And uh, it was one of the easiest presentations I ever had to make when I suggested that we join Paradigm for Parity. At the same time, Beth, uh, UTC has many resources. Uh, you're able to, like you said, spend a lot of time recruiting the mm-hmm. best, the most talented. Um, you're looking again to uh, eliminate this gender gap. Is it possible for all companies to do this? I think, first of all, I believe that everything's possible. And uh, you just, with commitment and hard work, and as you said, a champion at the top, um, the work that we do uh, people would have said years ago was impossible. The products we make, we make things fly. Uh, we move the world's population, the equivalent of uh, every three days with Otis elevators. We're able to work in the summer because of the products at Carrier. Those things were all deemed to be not possible. It's possible, and it, it, and it has to happen. And I'm committed to this. And as a mother of a daughter in the workplace, I know how important it is uh, for her to be able to think that she can do anything. That's what I've taught her all along. I don't want an artificial barrier just because of her gender to get in the way. Uh, We're also here in Connecticut. We hear a lot about the business climate. You mentioned recruiting, retention. Is it more difficult for UTC these days? Well, look, I think people have lots of choices. And, you know, we have to recognize that as a mother of millennials. I, you know, they have ideas about where they want to work and what they want to do. Connecticut is a great place to work and a great place to live. We have, you know, lately, however, when we recruit people in, I would say they will Google State of Connecticut and they'll see some of our peers have made other choices about where they want their headquarters. I think, though, looking at the whole, we like Connecticut. Um, I've lived here my entire work life. I think it's been a great place to raise a family. And I think the work that we have can attract uh, talent. That being said, there's competition out there, and uh, we, it makes it sometimes a little bit more difficult. You mentioned being a mother. Uh, talk about some of the other executives uh, at your company uh, that are women and some of the challenges they may have faced working for other corporations that they see you know, they're being valued um, at UTC now. Well, what I think is really important is um, some of the changes that we most recently made, particularly on parental leave. I've had several women executives come up to me who are younger than me, obviously, and have just had children. And that's made a difference on whether they decided to stay and stay in the workplace or stay with UTC because it allowed them the ability for that that very important bonding time with their, with their baby. I also have several women who work with me within the Human Resources Department we, who are very much committed to this agenda item, too, and very much help lead this charge. It's not just me and Greg alone. Uh, clearly, there are there are, uh, there's a huge team behind us, and uh, there's a good many of those who are women who are committed to make sure that uh, we not only change the way we work at UTC, but also continue to attract the best talent here, because we really do think we've got a, gr- a special place to work. But the motto, Executive Vice President and Chief Human Resources Officer at U- UTC, United Technologies Corporation, uh, they've pledged that women will fill 50 percent of the corporation's leadership roles by the year 2030. The company is already more than halfway there. Beth, so uh, glad that you're able to join us today. Thank you so much, Lucy. It's my pleasure. This is Where We Live. I'm Lucy Dalpethanchel. Coming up, we'll hear more about efforts to boost women into leadership positions. And once they've reached that level, does that mean the pay gap goes away? We want to hear from you, too. What roadblocks have you encountered in seeking promotions at work? Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live.
This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalbathanchel. Today we're talking about gender disparities that exist in the corporate world. It's not just a problem in the U.S. Deloitte, in its latest Women in the Boardroom report, finds that only 4% of women globally hold CEO and board chair positions. Now, how are companies approaching this issue? To tell us more, we're joined now by Anne Hedgepeth, Vice President of Government Relations and Public Policy at the American Association of University Women, or AAUW. She joins us from NPR's headquarters in Washington, D.C., and welcome to the show. Thanks for having me this morning. Uh, before the break, we were hearing about Connecticut-based UTC. Uh, they've got a, a goal to increase the number of women in corporate leadership positions to 50% uh, by the year 2030. And uh, we heard that they're at 29% already. Is that pretty unique in the corporate world, Bet Anne? You know, there's a lot to celebrate recently when we think about women in leadership. Um, We have a record number of women Fortune 500 CEOs moving from 21 to 32 in the past year. And some of our biggest companies are being run by women, uh, places like GE and IEM, Pepsi and Lockheed. Um, But at the end of the day, women are still woefully underrepresented. And when we think about the fact that only about 6% of Standard & Poor 500 companies have women CEOs, about 20% of their board seats are filled by women, it's certainly exciting to see UTC not only leading the way on their current status, having women in important roles, but also acknowledging that there's more work to be done. So let's talk about the barriers uh, that's keeping women from these positions. Uh, What does it look like out there in the corporate world? What are some of the challenges women are facing uh, when they're working in these environments? Yeah, and I would start even by saying some of the challenges women face uh, in leadership roles are not even just unique to the corporate world, but we certainly see it there. AUW did some research, a report called Barriers and Bias, and we looked across sectors and really thought about what are those challenges? What are sort of the commonalities um, that women are facing in various different roles in the careers they pursue? And we see issues in the pipeline as they move through their careers. We see that persistent sex discrimination remains a challenge, a barrier that they try to get over at various points. Balancing caregiving is a real issue that women still face, and not all workplaces are supportive of the realities of all of their employees' lives outside of the job. We do also see that there's a lot of work to be done around building networks and mentors, and even by fighting things like stereotypes and bias that women still face. So I think there are a number of different fronts on which the work can take place to think about ways to better support all workers in their paths um, through their careers, but specifically women to start to break down some of the challenges that they uniquely still face, starting from day one in their career all the way through to maybe a boardroom or the C-suite. Uh, you mentioned caregiving uh, is, is a challenge. When women take time off from their careers and they, uh, on their resume they have that uh, a few years where they may not have worked because they're raising their young children. How does that play into uh, when they try to enter the workforce again and the opportunities um, that they may not receive? Well, you know, I think that it's really important to keep in mind that choices that anyone make uh, are not made in a vacuum. They're organizational choices or organizational influences, cultural influences, economic influences, and policy influences that I think we all grapple with. Um, And certainly when it comes to dealing with both choices to have children, um, but also the caregiving responsibilities many people face uh, with aging parents Mm -hmm. or loved ones. Um, we do see that women still bear a larger portion of that work, and that work takes place outside of the workplace. And some employers have really stepped up to the plate. They've made things like uh, paid leave available to workers. They've acknowledged that it can be uh, a critical component to keeping people engaged in the workforce over their careers. Some workplaces aren't as committed to those types of supports, and that's a place where policy can play a big role, and that's something that we're certainly seeing across the country today, where states are stepping up and saying that paid family and medical leave is a critical component of all employees' career trajectory, 
And they're making it available on the state level so that workers can take time out when they need to, but also come back to the workforce when they're able. You mentioned uh, some companies are allowing benefits like paid family leave, uh, but oftentimes it's at the large corporations like UTC and Deloitte that have the resources um, that they're able to provide these kinds of benefit packages. If you want to work for a nonprofit or a small company, are they the ones that, that are left on the sidelines? It's such a good question. And I do think it's worth mentioning um, that there are a lot of creative solutions for all types of companies to provide the supports that their workers need. But one of them is to look at ways that places like, uh, or ways that policy can be a part of that. Having a state program means that all workplaces may be able and or are able, excuse me, to participate in offering that support to all of their workers. And I think that's something to keep in mind about it shouldn't just be, you know, a lottery by your zip code or your boss about whether or not you have the supports uh, that make it possible for you to remain engaged in your workplace. Now, Anne, you mentioned uh, biases and, and sexism. How do we get at the root of those problems? Yeah, and they are long term and pernicious. And I think it's really important for us all to acknowledge that we all carry biases that influence uh, the way that we engage in our workplaces and our communities. AUW took on uh, a approach and initiative uh, making available an implicit bias test that anyone can take. It's available on our website, and it looks at the ways that we may all associate leadership with maybe not women. Um, we have uh, we all carry around some biases that may have us think about the roles that different people play in the workplace, um, and those then influence the way that we engage with our colleagues, uh, the way we make promotion decisions, the way that we are part of our workplaces. And taking something like an implicit bias test and beginning to understand our own personal biases can be a really important first step in tackling them and thinking about that as an important investment in your workforce, um, engaging your employees around identifying the biases they carry um, and encouraging them to really push back on them can have such a positive influence on moving people uh, through different careers and different opportunities in anyone's companies. Because we're talking about biases and, and perception, I wanted to bring into the conversation now Samantha Tassone, president of Growth Fuel. It's a professional services firm uh, with several focuses, including advancing women's leadership based in Rochester, New York. Samantha, welcome to where we live. Thank you for having me. Pleasure to be here. So I understand that you are a consultant. You work with uh, female executives and leaders. Uh, talk about uh, this idea of advancing women's leadership. What's holding women back? That's a great question. And, you know, I echo what the um, individuals prior to me have have stated that, you know, it is a multidimensional um, challenge that we're faced with. And, and there certainly is ownership on both sides meaning the corporate side, um, males and females. So the research and the work that I've done with my client base, um, and actually I testified in front of Congress last year, and the research that I did and working with my clients really came up with four key themes, in addition to the other things that are out there. But the women that I'm working with are high-impact women, high-achieving women, high-potential women who you know, I like to say, are already standing in their power, their potential, they've already arrived. And what they say that's holding them back in corporate America has everything to do with this unintentional bias. They feel like their voices are not heard when they're in the room. They say to me, I have more to give, I don't feel valued. And even some of them who are at partner levels have said, I feel like an imposter. So those are key themes that women who are sitting, some of them are sitting in the C-suite, some of them are entrepreneurs running their own companies, some of them are sitting at the director level, but they still feel like this power differential is, is real and it exists and they're being held back. So they have these feelings, so does that mean that they end up leaving their jobs? I mean, how does that impact retention? That's a great question. We, what we're seeing in corporate America is that there is a significant number of women leaving corporate America. If you look at the statistics for entrepreneurial businesses, they're at an all-time high. 
So when women aren't finding their place in corporate America, when they're not feeling included, when their voice is not feeling heard, when they're not feeling empowered, when they're not feeling like they're adding value, this is when women start to think, I can do more, I can do better, where can I better serve my needs, myself, my creativity, um, and, and provide value. And so this is one of the challenges that corporate America is facing is that women are choosing to self-select out. But, but it doesn't have to be that way. Um, it, you know, there's another side to this. And the other side that I work with my clients has to do with uh, gender intelligence and balancing that. And not necessarily, this is not necessarily an issue of confidence. No, no. Confidence is a component of, of what women are facing. Modern media puts out there a lot of discussion around why women aren't climbing the corporate ladder and that they're pinpointing it to women lacking confidence. And that's only a small piece of it. From my perspective, there's, there's, it's a multidimensional challenge that women are facing. And when I say there's dual ownership on both sides, women are not victims in corporate America. Women, women own part of the, the, the challenge, the obstacles that are being faced in corporate America, meaning that they have the ability to, uh, you know, to change the conversation, right? My goal um, is to encourage conversation, the, the level of conversational competence that's out there for women, uh, for males and females, I should say. This is where we live. Uh, today we're talking about uh, ways that women can advance uh, further in the corporate world. Uh, not many women are leading companies or on boards. Uh, how do we change that? Uh, uh, on the phone with us, Samantha Tassone, president of Growth Fuel, a professional services firm uh, focusing on advancing women's leadership based in Rochester, New York. Also, Anne Hedgepeth, vice president of government relations and public policy at the American Association of University Women, joining us today from NPR's headquarters in Washington, D.C. Um, Samantha, I wanted to go back to you uh, before hearing from Anne um, to talking about how we bring uh, men into this conversation. How involved are they today? I love that question because as it becomes more public, uh, as, the, as the Fortune 500 companies are stepping on board and creating awareness such as UTC, such as Starbucks. Starbucks in, in, just in January of this year published that they wanted to take their public board seats and their gender balance from 20% to 36%. So as this becomes more commonplace for more public companies, private companies are saying, what do I need to do? 21st century leadership is changing and it's evolving into a more balanced energy between masculine and feminine energy, and it's a different leadership style. And so men, the male leaders um, that I've worked with in organizations that, uh, that I support, have said to me, I've literally been tapped on the shoulder by male CEOs who have said, what can I do? You know, I understand what you're doing for the females and how you're helping support them and providing this professional development, but I'm a leader too, and and I need to know what gender intelligence is all about and and how do I need to lead differently. And that that is an awareness that the, the male gender leaders, you know, those that have it, will step into it and begin to understand how to create this inclusive environment and how to balance. And a lot of times it really has a lot to do with, it doesn't even have to start at the top. It's, you know, from a male perspective, it's understanding that a female voice is not being heard in the room. President Obama, um, his team, there was an article that was presented, I think it was in the Washington Post, who said it's called the, uh, the Echo Theory. And the women on his team were not feeling heard, and so they created um, a bond and said and noticed that when a woman's voice wasn't being heard, another woman woman picked it up and she echoed the theory, uh, uh, the, the, I should say the comment, mm-hmm. and so the, the the comment from the first woman contributor was not lost. So there are there are definitely ways in which women can get their voices out there, but men can do it too. So, so male leaders in the room can identify and be present and help other women get their voices heard. That's just one quick, easy way to, to support one another. And I'll go back to you. Uh, Samantha mentioned uh, uh, pre- under President Obama. Let's talk about the gender gap at the White House today and how that's impacting perceptions. Yeah, I think it's certainly something where um, all workplaces may be 
should be taking a look at what their gender pay gaps look like, um, auditing what salaries are, and asking questions about where there are gaps, particularly between men and women, but also if there are gaps among race or ethnicities and different roles. These are important questions. And you'll remember that White Houses of the past have had that scrutiny on them as well. And AUW has been clear that where there are gaps, uh, we should seek to close them. It is disheartening to see a pay gap grow, though. And I think that's sort of the news out of uh, the current White House recently is that rather than continuing to make progress uh, in narrowing the gap between men and women in roles in the White House, we're seeing the gap grow again. And for us, that certainly begs the question of whether the leadership is there um, to continue to move forward with changing the dynamic um, at all levels in all sectors, ensuring that women have equal opportunities. I'll also mention that we had seen, of course, in a prior administration, a real commitment to take taking on issues around pay equity and even an initiative, a pledge that over 100 companies took in partnership with the White House um, to do these types of pay equity audits on the, of their employees to change any gaps and to create better processes in their workplaces to hire and compensate people in a way that's equitable and related to their skills and roles and not about some of the biases that may still persist. Those are really important initiatives that can run from public sector to private sector and can be guided by leadership at our highest levels. Um, And it would be great to see that happen again, although I'm not sure the news right now makes us uh, think it will. So we'll see. Uh, If someone's leading a small company, are there resources out there for them uh, to to help them with this, this gender gap? I certainly think that some of the examples we've heard today so far are good ones for any company to think about taking on. Auditing your pay, and there are good corporate examples out there. Uh, Thinking about your policies and your procedures to make sure they're equitable and that you're thinking about biases that may be a part of those processes. Thinking about having all your employees take an implicit bias test or do some training around different leadership styles. And even as a leader yourself of a small company or a big company, thinking about being an authentic leader and one that provides mentorship and support support for all of your employees. I think all of these approaches are scalable across types of companies. And I hope that uh, no one would approach it as, oh, it's too much or we're not big enough. The investment in your employees matters and investment in being equitable towards your employees, I think, pays dividends in making sure that you have diverse voices at the table and success moving forward. Uh, We talked about uh, bringing uh, men to the table in this conversation, but are women doing enough in the corporate world to help other women? You know, I do think that we know that biases and stereotypes um, are carried by all of us. Mm -hmm. No one's really immune, and that's important to keep in mind. But certainly where women can be good uh, mentors and leaders and provide opportunities for other employees, um, I think that that's a space that all of us can strive to fill, men or women. We'll be talking about um, mentorship, the importance of mentorship, especially uh, for uh, women of color. That's coming up a little later in the show. I wanted to go back to Samantha Tassone. Uh, she's a consultant, president of, of Growth Fuel, a professional services firm. Uh, Samantha, uh, what in your experience, again, you're working with female executives. Are women uh, doing enough uh, in their professions to help other women? You know, it has to start with awareness. Um, And and women, some women, you know, are naturally competitive, but when we take a step back and we look at how we can help one another, um, you know, I love the saying, turn around and and pull the next woman up. Um, You know, if you you step into this with awareness and you are looking to support the growth of those around you um, and you lead with authenticity, I think that, um, you know, there's more work to be done and setting a goal for yourself as a woman leader to help, you know, and support, you know, whatever your number is that you can handle, two to three women, is a great goal to have and a great way to approach it and, and have the personal motto of pulling the next woman up.
and that's what we can all benefit from for sure. And, and Samantha, before we head to break, I wanted to uh, have you talk about the differences in leadership styles between uh, men and women. And are there advantages to having women leaders and um, in boards and leading companies? Oh, I think we can all mention that we would think that there are advantages, but can you talk through uh, some of the research, what research has shown? The research difference between men and women. So when we talk about the differences between leadership style, it requires us to talk about masculinity versus femininity and those traits that come along with it. And it doesn't have to be male specific or female specific. It's just masculinity versus femininity and and, and pulling those apart from the gender. So generally you think of masculine behaviors equivalent to things like being dominant, being controlling, always being center stage and having your voice out there you know, having a high need to identify what gets done, how it gets done. So if you think about leadership behavior from, from a extreme end of masculinity to the other end of the polarity scale, which is femininity, you think of someone who's quiet, maybe someone who's reserved, someone who, uh, masculine or feminine, I'm sorry, from a, from a femininity standpoint. Um, those kinds of traits belong to males and or females, and the, the difference is how do you choose to show up as a leader? And, and the answer, as with anything in life, has to do with balance. So from a performance under pressure perspective or frame of reference, I like to tell my clients when you step into a performance moment, if it's important to you, it's a performance moment, understand what the outcome needs to be and then decide whether you need to step in with more masculine energy or more feminine energy. And that's an important distinction for leaders because some situations you do need to be a little bit more firm and assertive and other times you need to use your ears and not your mouth. And so women can be good listeners and so can males be good listeners, but it's a choice that that you get to make Um, and performance and leadership has everything to do with awareness and being in the moment. We were hearing about the differences in leadership. I'll go back to Anne uh, Hedgepeth. Um, Are women, are they comfortable enough to own their success, Anne? You know, I absolutely think that we have seen um, strong leadership and real success from women. I started off the day talking to you about how we are actually at a great moment with record numbers of women CEOs and um you know, women who are filling more roles than ever before, which is a positive as much as it also reminds us of the gaps that still remain. I do think at the end of the day, um, as women continue to take on more and more leadership roles, we will have to continue to grapple with differences in leadership styles. Um, We will have to continue to grapple with remaining and persistent discrimination that occurs in the workplace. And I do think that, you know, that reminds us that there are not just sort of questions of whether women own success or women's choices, but also about the structures that are in place in workplaces and in our society that support and sometimes fail to support women in their leadership roles. And it does remind us then about sort of pushing forward and pushing out on some of remaining sort of challenges and barriers um, that women may be facing. And that includes, you know, improving our public policies. We talked about, you know, paid family and medical leave already today, but also thinking about where we can improve laws that have to do with pay equity and wage discrimination for women, but also for people of color in the workplace. And I think that those uh, policies are another place where additional work can take place to make sure that as people move into leadership roles, they're fully supported and have resources where there are barriers still in place. Anne Hedgepeth, Vice President of um, Government Relations and Public Policy at the American Association of University Women. Um, she joined us from NPR's headquarters in Washington, D.C. Um, she's going to remain with us. But I want to do thank uh, I want to thank Samantha Tassone, President of Growth Fuel, a professional services firm based in Rochester, New York. Samantha, thanks for your time today. I appreciate it. Thanks for inviting me. This is Where We Live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Today we're talking about the leadership gap in the corporate world. Some companies are taking initiative to hire more women leaders. There's still room for improvement. What are the challenges women of color face in getting that promotion or opportunity to be an executive? We'll find out more after the break.
This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Today we've been discussing the problem of few women in corporate leadership roles. Women of color face even greater barriers to advancement. To tell us more, on the phone with us, Jillian B. White, Senior Associate Editor at The Atlantic. Jillian, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. You've done some reporting on this. Tell us about what it looks like for African-American women in the workforce today. Yeah, so I think part of the thing with the conversation about women in the workplace um, kind of harkens back to what's happening in the broader conversation about women's rights and feminism, and that is a push towards intersectionality, right? So the conversation there is that while there may be a similar broad experience among women, there are also all of these disparate experiences, particularly among women of color. So when we look at women in um, board positions, fewer than 3% of the board of directors at Fortune 500 companies are women of color. Um, Only about 12% of black women are in the highest earning groups, which means that only about 12% of black women are in those manager roles, CEO roles, C-suite roles. Um, and black women have higher levels of, an, of unemployment and generally just aren't doing even as well as uh, other women or white women in uh, C-suite positions. At the same time, more black women today are in the job market. I'm seeing a statistic that the labor force participation rate of African-American women, 62 percent higher than uh, white women and Asian women. And yet they're still not getting these leadership roles. What are some of the things holding them back, Jillian? Yeah. So that number is, you know, pretty staggering. That is a lot of black women who are in the job market who are working Part of the problem that I found in my reporting is that 28% of women, black women, are employed in the service sector. And the issue there is that the service sector tends to provide lower wages, fewer benefits, such as paid sick days, adequate health care. So while they have work, it isn't necessarily what we would consider quality work. It's not necessarily work that allows them to do things like take a day off to care for a sick child without, you know, risking their job or risking significant pay loss. And a heavy chunk of them are the main breadwinners of their families. So when they're in their service jobs and they have uh, sick children or or sick relatives, um, their family also is getting impacted when they may lose their job because they have to take time off. Exactly. So there's this outsized impact for women of color, particularly black women, when they do have to do things like take some time off or when a family emergency comes up, because a lot of them do not have anyone else to rely on. A lot of them are single mothers or are the sole breadwinners in their house um, or are making the most money. So, you know, a day off or a slight loss of income for them is everything. It is the difference between being able to pay for rent or utilities. There is really no backup there. So there, it's kind of a bigger issue. I understand you've interviewed a lot of high-profile women, Melinda Gates being one. You also did an interview recently with the features editor at Essence, Lauren Williams. Let's talk about mentorship and, and what she told you about how it helped her career. Yeah, so one of the things that we've been looking at quite a bit over here at The Atlantic is the role of mentorship in helping people um, kind of rise in their corporate ranks and grow their careers. And that is really difficult, we find, when you are a woman of color. So one of the ways that's been explained to me is that if you think about who people tend to mentor, they tend to mentor people who remind them of themselves. And a lot of that has to do with background, with education, with physical appearance. Um, all of those things factor into who somebody kind of decides to pluck and make their protege. So as we've been talking about, as you guys have been talking about for the hour, a lot of the people in those highest leadership positions are white men. So when they pick protégés who look like them and are from similar backgrounds and they assume have similar interests, a lot of times those are other white men. Um, Women of color are perhaps the farthest away demographic that you can get from them. So it's really hard, we find, to make those mentoring connections between, you know, executives who may be older white men and younger women of color. Earlier, we profiled this paradigm for parity where you have corporations uh, banding together to say, you know, we're going to fill women in these leadership roles by a certain year. Are there similar initiatives out there of encouraging uh, women of color that are in the corporate world to mentor, to bring up other women like them um, into the ranks? There are, but the funny thing that I found is that a lot of things focus on women specifically or people of color specifically, not as many things focus on specifically women of color who have kind of this dual challenge when it comes to making themselves accessible and being um, kind of mentored by that upper echelon of workers. So while there are programs out there, I think part of the push now and part of the reason that intersectionality is so important in the conversation is to realize that 
black women, Hispanic women, Asian women, Native women are a very unique demographic, and their needs need to be tailored to. Anne Hedgepeth is with us from NPR's headquarters in Washington, D.C. She's vice president of government relations and public policy at the American Association of, of University Women. And I wanted to go back to you. We, we mentioned implicit bias, uh, and I wanted to talk about well, what's being done. Is there more training in workforce? But in, do we need to go further back to the dinner table, to our schools, to break this thinking that there are um, that genders are different and they can't accomplish the same thing uh, in the workforce? Absolutely. I really appreciate that question because I do think that we have to have a conversation about the way in which uh, we are creating women leaders and really empowering girls um, so that that pipeline can be robust and prove in the future to have women who are well positioned to be in leadership roles. Um, We at AEW, of course, spend a lot of time thinking about the way that our schools can be equitable. We advocate for policies like Title IX, which applies to opening classroom doors and laboratory doors so that women can participate in all types of school programs. Uh, It helps women and girls be a part of athletic opportunities, which research shows often has a connection um, to leadership in future roles. And we think a little bit about what are the experiences that women are having throughout their education um, that may or may not be making it challenging for them to be moving seamlessly through a career path that puts them in leadership roles. And recently, we did some research about student debt and more women than ever going into higher education. It's something to be championed. But at the end of the day, they're doing it at a very high cost. Women hold more of student debt outstanding student debt than men. And women of color, black women in particular, are having the hardest time paying it back. And back to this conversation about sort of the intersectional issues then that women in the workplace are dealing with, that economic insecurity makes it challenging early in your career to even figure out how to get to places like leadership roles and career opportunities, uh, trying to make ends meet and lacking some of the supports that are needed, plus the additional burden of something like student debt. These are real challenges uh, that if we don't tackle, we will continue to see the pipeline lose women before they even get to leadership roles. And so mentorship can start early. And indeed, I think thinking about the roles of women and men and reversing sort of any sort of biases and stereotypes can start, as you said, around a kitchen table and in our classrooms from day one. I think that's an important commitment we need to make to girls so that in the future we aren't asking some of these same questions. Ann Hedgepeth, Vice President of Government Relations and Public Policy at the American Association of University Women, or AAUW. And thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Also, Jillian B. White, Senior Associate Editor at The Atlantic, will tweet out some of your recent articles. Jillian, thank you for your expertise. Thanks so much. This is Where We Live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Our show is produced by Lydia Brown and Jeff Tyson. Our technical producer is Kion Wolf. WNPR's executive producer is Katie Tolarski. You can check out wmpr.org slash where we live for more about the show. As always, thanks for listening.